A mother is crying out for the life and safety of her three-year-old daughter allegedly raped by the father. Plus TV Africa is monitoring the development in Ibadan or your state capital where the mother spoke exclusively with our correspondent. Here is the pain of a mother who wants justice, not just for herself, but also for her infant who was reportedly violated by her biological father. Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps and women support groups have been called in to help as the mother seeks justice for her daughter. The first time I noticed she was defiled by her father was on June 4th, around past 10, when I walked in on them. I walked in on him standing close to the bed and my daughter was fast asleep and she was not wearing a sleep trouser. That's when I noticed something was wrong with my daughter. So the next day being June 5th, when I wanted to beat her, I just decided to check, to check her just to be sure that she was not tampered with. And lo and behold, when I checked, she was already tampered with. When it was time to beat my daughter, I asked her to remove her nika. Then I want to beat you. I had she and her brother that, okay, you should remove your nika, let me go and beat you. Then she came again, I was still on my machine. She came again and she lied down on the bed and she opened her leg. I just said, let me turn. I saw the first hole the other day, being June 5th, and this one was already wider. I decided to take a picture of it before going to the hospital. When I opened her to take a picture, then I saw small sperm around her vagina. So I took a picture of it. Then I took her to the hospital. As a mother, and with the experience, and the fact that she's in the hospital, um, as at the time I met with her, almost 10 days, and nobody has come. Even from the government, nobody has come to check on her. Nobody has um, even supported her with the medical bills, apart from family, friends, and you know, that are contributing. You know, the pain was just too much for her to bear. You know, when she called me back um, a few hours after, she was like, Ma, I thought that these people are supposed to be on my side. This is what is going on. They're like sweeping this case on the ground. It's like this man has some people backing him. You know, they've granted him bail. He's walking freely on the street. I said, don't worry. This is not something that you're going to handle alone. We're going to back you up with Child Protection Network. We're going to get, I'm also going to make sure that as much of media that we can get into this, because the media has a strong part to play. So when the result came out and it showed that there was penetration, that the hymen is no longer there, they went back again to rearrest him. And when they did, the hearing was supposed to be for on the 16th of July. That was this Thursday that just passed. But something happened, they went, is, the, the, the whole thing was reported at magistrate court. So I don't know who double-crossed who, they took it to the high court. They took his bail application to the high court. So when they got there, the judge said he wanted to see my baby and I on Wednesday. This is before 16, that was supposed to be the hearing. So we went there, and the judge said, um, he called us into his chambers. Then he said that he would just advise that I dropped the case, that because I didn't see him with my eyes, I should drop the case and I should leave him for God. It was painful because we left the hospital to the court and my daughter cannot hold her, we cannot hold her pool. And we've been here in the hospital here, this hospital, for 11 days. The latest is that the suspect has been rearrested by men of the NSCDC waiting to be arraigned. When the case was reported to NSCDC arrested command, we charged the case to court. And when we charged him to court, the justice, who is in charge, the judges in charge of the case, demanded the man in the NSCDC custody at Equator uh, uh, A in Nevada. And after that, we took him back to court on 16th of July this month also. He did that. The justice granted the uh, suspect bail. And when they granted him bail, the man has not made the bail condition that the court gave to him. So they still have to remand him as NSD's custody in Agodi here. So the man is still in our custody in, at uh, Agodi. Uh, While this is applauded in some quarters, there are still questions yet to be answered, which include among many. Why is the police not taking the prosecution? 
why was the suspect granted bail and the bail was reportedly paid by the company that the culprit works for? What is the state attorney waiting for since it is a rape case? Plus TV Africa is following up on this story and will bring you a detailed report as more evidence emerge during investigation. Joining us to talk more on this pathetic case is the Director, Legal Defense and Assistance Project, led up Mr. Chino Obiagu San, and also the Executive Director of Women's Advocates and Research Documentation Center, Dr. Abiola Akiodea Folabi. Good morning and thanks for joining us, Mr. Chino. Good Hello, morning. sir. Can you hear me? Okay, welcome. Um, I want to know how you describe this kind of case in the court of law. Well, it's very pathetic. Um, but also remember that in the court of law, uh, there is procedure. And I think uh, the procedure is that once someone is um, charged for an offense, uh, there is um, an offense for which the, the legal advice of the director of public prosecutions is required, the court may adjourn for that purpose and where is a available offense grant the person bail. Uh, pending the time that the, the DPP provides his legal advice uh, and then and the case which of the court, the trial will go on, um, whether before the high court or the magistrate court. So I understand and that is the process in which the case is at the moment that the case file has been transferred to DPP or your state. And we do hope that DPP will act expeditiously uh, on that. It's a really sad. I, I want to quickly bring in Dr. Akiode. Um, how do you think that this woman can be helped? Um, there's a need for, um, um, there are a, a lot of discussion around support system. Um, the chat, I had the child protection network saying that they are willing uh, to uh, support uh, the woman. Uh, unfortunately, the society does not have the system that we would expect. Uh, by now, you would have expected that the state government would have taken over this matter. Uh, uh, they can take the girl and the mother you know, to a shelter so that they are safe from uh, any form of uh, uh, negotiation you know, by uh, the society. What you would expect, and I think that's what you see already playing out, is the community acquiescence, you know, trying to uh, change our minds, not to prosecute the matter, people, you know, bribing and all of that, and that's the kind of thing that we are seeing there. So one would expect that the state, you know, should be able to support. Is this a common occurrence? I mean, I'm sure that you've been in advocacy for many years. Is this, you know, something that you've dealt with multiple, multiple times? Yeah, it is very common. It's very common. And at times it's um, actually even from the family, you know, of the victim or survivor that you see the pressure coming. Uh, you know, because, um, uh, because the father is involved. So you will see the relative talking to the mother, you know, and trying to convince the mother, you know, about uh, uh, backing out on the matter and saying that it's a private matter, it's an issue that should be resolved. You know, at the home front. And for me, it's also one of the reasons why uh, this issue has uh, become endemic as it is. That's why we have a kind of pandemic, because uh, there are a whole lot of cases like this that go uh, unpunished. So that's why um, it's important uh, for the society to take this much more seriously. So it's very common. It's very, so it, there are a lot of cases that uh, are not addressed because of this kind of interference, either at the police level or at the community level. I, I would love to speak with you a little bit more on um, the societal challenges that we have with cases like this. Um, I hope that we have the time this morning. But let, let, let me bring you back, uh, Mr. Chino, now. Um, what legal backing has the NSCDC got to be handling a matter in a state like Oyo? Um, isn't this a criminal case, or can it still be treated as a civil case? No, it, of course, the, S, uh, the NCDC has um, the... the the statutory power to prosecute, to investigate and prosecute cases of this nature. There is no doubt about that. Uh, by his act, the law establishing it. Um, just like any other law enforcement agency has the powers to investigate and initiate prosecution of any criminal case in, by filing the necessary charges uh, in the court. Um, the court, the Supreme Court has said so. 
Now, if the if it is a matter for which uh, the attorney general attention is needed, as in this one, then the case file has to go to attorney general, and then, like uh, Dr. Abiola said, the attorney general may want to take over the prosecution, which is what one expects, considering the gravity of the allegation. Uh, the, the case file has not been forwarded to the DPP's office, and lawyers in the DPP office should take over the prosecution. The, we expect that the Citizens' Rights Department or the Social Welfare Department should be able to hold washing brief to be sure that there are no compromises. Because like Dr. Abiola said, this is a usual occurrence where pressure is put on the victim, uh, like he's been put in this case, uh, from all sorts, even from religious bodies, even from families, to, to drop the prosecution. But having said that, it is not in the place of, of the mother to decide whether or not to go on with prosecution. She's just a witness in the matter. Okay. So the, the, the ACJ, the new Criminal Justice Act, has said that the, the police or the law enforcement agents can even go ahead with prosecution, even without the consent of the mother or the victim. So the only thing is that she may not appear to, you know, yeah. or come to, to testify. But if there is sufficient evidence without her testimony, the, the, the prosecution can go on even without I, I want to know from your... And from, we want to encourage this to happen because yeah. this culture of silence is actually creating a lot of problems in this kind of shit. And I agree with Dr. Abiola that it's something that society needs to deal with. Yeah, we're going to speak with Dr. Um, Akiode in a bit. But I want to know from your legal um, perspective, how can we make cases like this easier to prosecute in Nigeria? How, how is it possible that we can remove some of these loopholes that victims and survivors have to go through um, before they finally get justice? Because like you know, um, Doc has said, it's, it's not the first time. These are cases that are very common um, across the country. So how can we make it easier for family to see to get justice instead of you know, a case pulling for months and months and months and maybe even years? Well, uh, uh, that has been the problem over the years. But in 2015, the Administration of Criminal Justice Act was passed at federal level, and a number of states are adopting it. Under this law, such cases like sexual offenses, you know, like, such as this, can be tried expeditiously, can be tried day to day, and in order to reduce the stigma of, uh, of, of exposing the victim, the, the law has provided that the, the name of the, of the victim or the name of the person, you know, it should not be um, disclosed. The identity should not be disclosed and the evidence can be taken in chambers, in confidentiality, or even screamed on masks. Because sometimes families tell, the, you know, the victims, oh, you don't want to go and expose yourself to lawyers to ask you questions and get you embarrassed and then you pass through second, secondary victimization and so on. In order to avoid the trauma of repeating the story all over again to, to the courts, the, this law is put in place in Section 232 of the Administration of Criminal Justice Law um, 2015. And I'm sure that all your state has adopted this law. And if so, they should be able to use it to the fullest to ensure that uh, this family is not further traumatized, the mother and the child, and that uh, not, there, will, there will be no cover-up in terms of forcing them mother or even paying money because we've seen instances where families are paid money so that they can um they can drop the charges and and, and not appear to testify yeah. so I, I think the law the recent law scj has provided a, a leeway to fast track these kind of cases and to protect the identity of the victim at least for fisher okay i'm, I'm going to come back to you um i was i'm really just hoping that we can have like a one two three step with regards to prosecution, um, you know, there's evidence, you know, um, there is, you know, maybe also uh, forensic evidence, you know, that maybe, you know, we need to call in at a time like this, you know, to ensure that the the um, person who, the perpetrator, you know, doesn't go scot-free. But we'll, we'll get back to you. Dr. Akiode, how do we break away from something that you had earlier mentioned, the malady of family secret, as in the case of this woman? She's currently under pressure from family, including her sister, who is a nurse. How do we break away from that, you know, narrative in Nigeria? Yeah. Well, I, I think that um, the, it's important for the law to uh, take its course. Um, and, that, and from what the SAN said, uh, the, the law is gradually dealing with that because it's always been like a big problem for us. Uh, because once, uh, it, it, once the family uh, gets involved, one of the things that would happen is that uh, they would not, there will be no evidence, there will be no witness, 
So they, they won't have witnesses to call. So the police will say, well, because there's no uh, witness, there's nobody who's ready to give evidence because before he can be convicted, you know, there must be evidence that and there must also be uh, some people who want to say that um, that happened. So it's always been like a, a major problem. And with what the SAN is saying, they have to, so what people also need to know is also to be able to let the relatives and parents know. And what, I, what we do in our own organization is that when it comes to that level, you just tell them, the matter has since left my table. It's with the states. So it is the responsibility of the state to ensure that they push the case to a logical conclusion. But unfortunately, because of corruption and a whole lot of other things, we don't see this happening. So there's a need for more monitoring of these cases. And that's why we have this kind of pandemic. So the, the, the Office of the Attorney General of each state must see that's the responsibility to ensure that once a case is reported, and I think in a place like Lagos, they started doing that. Once it's reported, once it's a case of defilement of this nature, or it's a case of rape, you know, the, it's important that the prosecution takes it much more seriously. Because the, 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 the truth of the matter is that the rape is on the loose, it can happen again and again. And that's yeah. why we have this high number of rape cases you know, that we're having. There are a whole lot right. of issues. Uh, victims are reluctant to talk because of victim blaming, because of stigmatization in the society. Uh, once uh, you are raped, the community knows, the family knows, you have been described as all that together that was raped yesterday and all of that. So, uh, so, so because of community acquiescence, too, people don't want to speak. They don't want to talk. They want to just come right out. And that's what you see happen within the family. You know, okay. people want to just uh, keep it. So it is a responsibility of the state to ensure that once we have precedent, where they refuse to accept uh, begging or, you know, yeah. because once you, okay. when, okay, once uh, they arrest the rapist, yeah, because of time, we're, we're um, running, you know, out of time. I, I want to quickly just bring in um, uh, Mr. Chino. Uh, quickly, um, if you can, in 15 seconds, professional advice on what must be done um, to pursue this matter to ensure that justice is served. Um, in 15 seconds, please. Yeah, I think what's important is that the family should be resolved. They should resolve to continue with the case. The mother should strongly, I mean, I know the trauma she's passing through, but she must resolve to, to go on with the case. I and mean, if pressure is brought to bear, like Dr. Abiola said, you just tell them where the matter is in court and let the justice uh, take its course. Um, then the, there's a need to preserve the evidence, forensic evidence, yeah. if there's medical report, okay. you need to preserve it and present it. And then the attorney general should take over this case so that it can be properly prosecuted by professional prosecutors. It's a really sad story. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chino Biagusan, a Director, Legal Defense and Assistance Project, and also uh, Dr. Abiola Kyodea Filabi, um, Executive Director, Women's Advocates and Research Documentation Center, for speaking with um, us this morning. Um, God bless you, and we hope uh, to, of course, uh, speak again um, pretty soon.